I've never been one for face-to-face -face encounters. I solve all my problems with satisfaction, but never through confrontation. I'm content with this, and it suits me just fine. However, I've come to realize that this is a concept my wife can't seem to grasp. I'm Ted Briscoe, and I've been married to Angela for 10 years. Angela isn't a dazzling beauty. She's just an ordinary homemaker with chestnut hair and brown eyes. We have twin daughters who are still in elementary school. I work as an insurance agent. Nothing particularly interesting or impressive, but I make a good living, and the savings that accumulate will provide for my retirement. I assumed we got married because we loved each other, but now I'm not so sure. Angela seemed comfortable with how things were going for the first few years. I suppose the novelty of being married and having a family was enough. We attended company and neighborhood social events when we could. Lately, it seemed Angela was impressed by husbands who had important or dynamic jobs. It seemed like the job was more about prestige than money. She wasn't like that when we got married. But now it seemed to matter more. I got the sense that she was less and less impressed by my status at work or as a husband. My non-confrontational approach to problem. Solving seemed to be a significant issue for her. I usually opted for quietly resolving most difficulties, which irritated her. She seemed to think a real man should face his problems head on and win through intimidation. It's a concept I couldn't swallow. I think that's what led to my current dilemma. Please understand, I'm not a weakling. I might come off as not very manly, but I won't allow myself to be walked over. However, I refrain from direct confrontation with adversaries. My methods may sometimes seem unbecoming of a real man, but I care more about results than appearances. What people think of me doesn't matter, as long as I come out on top. Many of the things I do wouldn't be tolerated by a real man under any circumstances. There are things more important than pride. My wife finds this unacceptable. Today, I'm sitting in my car, around the corner from my house. The kids have gone to school, and I left for work 20 minutes ago. My job is flexible, so slacking off during odd hours isn't an issue as long as I get the work done. What I'm waiting for doesn't happen every day, and I'm here in anticipation. I didn't have coffee for breakfast to avoid worrying about needing to pee. 20 minutes later, a black and white police car slowly drove down the street and stopped at my door. Frank Perella, one of the best in the city, got out of the car and waved to his partner as he drove away. A minute later, Frank entered my front door. You can see the complexity of my situation. How can a man with my character flaws reconcile his wife's affair with a police officer? Who should I tell about this? And how can I prove it? I'm sure most people won't approve of what I'm planning. But I'm not like most people. And I don't live to please most people. Anyone who wears shorts that display the qualities of real men will condemn me. I don't care because I want results. When I was in elementary school, I suffered from the same character weaknesses I have now. I don't think I developed them. I believe I was born with them. I'm sure there's a scientific name for them, but I've never bothered to look it up. Of course, I've never undergone any therapy or anything like that. In fifth grade, I made a good friend named Charlie Higgins. Charlie was my complete opposite. He was big, ugly, and always stood out. 
He wasn't really smart, and I quickly discovered he couldn't read. We spent a lot of time together that year, and by the time we reached sixth grade, Charlie could read as well as anyone in the class. He always remembered about special sessions and the fact that I did it unnoticed by others. Charlie stuck by me until we reached 10th grade. It was nice because no one ever bothered me when he was around. Unfortunately, Charlie liked girls too, and by the end of the year, one of them got pregnant by him. He dropped out of school, married the girl, and got a job as a bricklayer's assistant. Soon, Charlie became the father of a little girl. I kept tabs on Charlie, but we didn't maintain close ties. I kept to myself after Charlie left, but fate had it that I became a target for Jock, bully Troy Manning in senior year. I did everything I could to avoid him, short of running away. I could never outdo him in anything, whether it was physical or verbal. Troy enjoyed subjecting me to public conflicts in the hallways and on school grounds. His pride and joy, like all jocks, was his university jacket, which he wore every day, whether it was hot or cold. Ink comes in a cute little square bottle with a short nose. Of course, it's indelible. I had no trouble getting a pass to the gym, and it was easier than pie to pour the whole bottle of ink through the ventilation holes of Troy's locker. You don't have much control in such an endeavor, but I achieved enough success to render his jacket unusable for the rest of the year. Of course, school jackets aren't easily replaced by just going to the corner store. Poor Troy had to do without it. No one ever found out who spilled ink on him. Unfortunately, the bullying didn't stop. And that's when Troy started wearing his university sweater, just as I expected. It wasn't as impressive as the jacket, but he still used it to strut around with an air of importance. The first part of the preparation was completed. The next day, I went to school with a new bottle of ink and a sock filled with three golf balls inside. I don't like pain, and I'm not a massagist, but extreme measures were necessary to rectify my injustice. Since Troy's locker was next to the boys' bathroom, I planned to linger by the door when he discovered that his favorite sweater was also covered in ink. He was furious and all the kids in the hallway couldn't help but notice his tantrum. I stood by the bathroom door with a self-satisfied smirk on my face, hoping he would glance my way. And of course he did. He needed someone to take out his anger on, and I baited him. He barged in, shoved me into the bathroom, and pressed me against the wall. All the boys in the bathroom fled to the hallway along with the rest of the crowd. He made more noise and bluster than anything else. And I was a little disappointed by his feeble attack because it meant more work for me. He left no marks on me. Hitting myself in the head and face with a golf ball. Filled sock was at least cruel. It would have been easier to ask someone else to do it for me. But I was determined. It only took a few minutes, and I was swollen enough to know I'd have two black eyes and a broken nose. Unfortunately, due to some miscalculations, I also knocked out one of my incisors, so it was almost falling out. It took a few minutes for my vision to start darkening, and that was fine. The golf balls flew out of the bathroom window into the bushes below, and the torn sock went into the trash bin. I stretched out on the floor in one of the stalls. A few minutes later, a student walked in and found me. The school nurse decided it was best to send me to the emergency room. Troy Manning was not only suspended from school, but also stripped of all scholarships. My tooth healed fine, 
and my face had completely healed by the time we needed to take graduation photos. No one bothered me for the rest of the year. Troy, of course, denied everything. Frank Perella became my new Troy Manning. Two hours later, the black and white car stopped in front of the house. Frank stepped out of the front door, and I watched as my loving wife kissed him goodbye. She was wearing a robe. I waited for about five minutes and then entered the house. As I expected, water was running in the shower. The bed was still messy, and her clothes were scattered on the floor. Next to the bedside table was a trash bin with a light blue plastic bag stuffed inside. That was all I needed to see. I quietly left the house and went to work. Returning home from work in the evening, I dove into the garage and retrieved the blue bag from the trash bin. I put two rubber bands in the zippered bag and placed it on my desk, where I was sure Angela wouldn't find it. All the swimmers were dead by now, but DNA lives on. By the end of the second week, I had ten filled rubber bands. It was time for the next step of my plan. Frank never came to my house on Fridays. I learned that on that day, he visited his mother at the nursing home in the city center. His partner dropped him off at 10 a.m. and picked him up around 11 a.m. It was easy for me to arrange a meeting with one of my clients in the building. Elderly people eagerly anticipate company, even if it's an insurance agent. There was a surveillance camera at the entrance to the underground garage in the nursing home building. But it was the only one. Very few of the residents drove, so most of the cars using the garage were in some way visitors. One day during lunchtime, I lingered and headed to the interstate between states. There were several adult stores at the entrance ramps. For 20 bucks, I bought a set of ball bearings, a marinade syringe, and a 30-centimeter aquarium tube completed my shopping list. I was ready to work. With each passing day, Angela became more gloomy. Her contempt for me steadily grew. Wednesday morning was crucial for my plan. Usually, I avoided her taunts and jabs. But today, I responded. As I finished breakfast, she made a sarcastic remark about the fact that I no longer made love to her. She walked all over my masculinity several times. This was what I was looking for. I'm sorry, darling. Even if your lover is protected, I still don't want to risk catching a disease. I hope you understand. She stood there with her usual smirk on her face, just looking at me. Only in the last few months has she been treating me like this. She didn't say anything. It seemed like she was trying to provoke me to say more. I don't think you realize the seriousness of the situation you've put yourself in, I said. The smile suddenly vanished from her face. She started fidgeting a bit, and her eyes darted around the room. Now she didn't know what to do. As I began to walk out the door, I turned and said, He won't be able to protect you forever. Leaving, I noticed a slight fear in her eyes. It worked perfectly. By the time I got to work, there was a police car parked behind my bumper. I sat in my car with the window down when Frank Perella approached. He leaned on the door of my car and gave me the meanest look he could muster. Who do you think you are? My relationship with your wife is none of your business, and I would advise you to stay out of it and keep your mouth shut. If you make any more smart remarks about Angela, I'll make sure you get a nice stay in Greeterford. I'm sure some of the guys there would be happy. To have you as a neighbor, do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Crystal clear. 
He gave me one of his confident smirks and walked back to the patrol car. I was sure Angela would call him after I left the house, and I hoped he would stop me. I turned off the recorder and got to work. It promised to be a good day. Dinner that evening was very quiet. The girls and I chatted a bit, but Angela hardly said a word. The self-assured smirk that was on her face disappeared. Every time I caught her gaze on me, she quickly looked away. She avoided eye contact at all costs. Until today, she had looked at me with a slight disdain. I hadn't even started to implement my plan yet, but she was already beginning to fear. Although she might not like me anymore, she seemed to know me. The uncertain future made her feel very uncomfortable. I don't believe Frank could have said anything to make that disappear. On Thursday, I spent the whole day preparing for the important day. I found the nearest emergency room at the hospital and dialed my lawyer's number on speed dial. A bit of rough sandpaper gave the ball bearings a rough surface. I collected liquid from each of my equipment and put it in a small medicine bottle. I attached the tube to the marinade syringe so it wouldn't come off. Everything was carefully laid out, and I repeated it a hundred times to make sure everything was perfect. That night, Angela slept with the girls. I didn't ask why. The most difficult part of my plan was using the ball bearings. I gave them quite a bit of roughness and then pushed them in as deep as I could. I inserted them just before leaving the house. In four hours, part of my body should be hurting badly. It was around 10 on the dot when the patrol car dropped off Frank near the nursing home elevator. A few minutes later, I rode the same elevator to visit Martha Forbush. Martha was 70, and she loved company. I spent about 20 minutes with her, then quietly left. She knows I was there, but her sense of time was a bit muddled. It was a painful visit because I had to sit with those ball bearings. Safely back at my car, I slightly tore my coat, as well as a couple of belt loops and the seam on my pants. I kept a close eye on the time. Frank seemed to be a punctual guy. I filled the marinade syringe from the medicine bottle. There was still a little left, so I leaned back and smeared my shirt. Just in time, Frank stepped out of the elevator, and a moment later, they picked him up. Now the pain came. I grabbed the string and yanked as if it were a band. I grabbed the string and yanked as if it were a band. It was very uncomfortable, but I felt relief. I walked out of the garage from the back and dumped all my belongings into the storm drain. Why would anyone look? Looking as shocked and disheveled as I could, I stumbled into the St. Joseph Emergency Department and announced to the world that I had been hurt. The police and crisis center were immediately called. I was taken to the examination room, where they undressed me and folded my clothes into a bag. The doctor confirmed that I had indeed been subjected to pain and left me with a lab technician. Around this time, the police arrived. They asked the lab tech to leave for a while, and then spent 30 minutes getting information from me. When I suggested that this person might be a policeman, the room fell silent. Since the DNA of all government employees is registered for exclusion purposes, the woman investigating such cases assured me that they would have a positive result within 24 hours. She was confident that by then all police personnel would be cleared. The hospital notified Angela of what had happened and asked her to bring some clothes for me. She brought clothes but didn't bother to check on me or inquire about my condition. After the police left, the lab tech returned. 
My name is Ted. Sorry, we weren't introduced. They call me Jill. My real name is Jillian. She looked at me somewhat strangely with a slight smile. I watched as she filled out forms and sorted samples for processing. Jill, who will receive a copy of the DNA report? The police. Is that all? The lab will provide certified copies to anyone who wants or needs them. Why do you ask? Could you please include me and my lawyer for a copy? Of course, no problem. Anything else? What do you do with the remaining samples? You know, the excess ones. We usually just dispose of them. Why do you ask? Could you mark or certify the remaining samples, then store them? Sure, we have a secure storage, and we can guarantee that the samples won't be compromised. I think I'm in love with you, Jill. Can you do all this for me? By this time, I was dressed and sitting on the edge of the bed. Jill sat down next to me and smiled. I can take care of everything for you and maybe even more if you promise to treat me to dinner. I'm married. I know, but I bet you won't be for long. Why all this? Why are you interested in having dinner with me? I think you're a very smart person, and I want to get to know you better. I think I know what you did today, but I'm not exactly sure how you did it. I'll keep quiet if you treat me to dinner tonight. This wasn't part of my plans. I hadn't anticipated this, but I found myself liking this girl. Let's meet at the cafe at 7, I said. This is a date. Can I call you a cab so you can go home? Your wife left half an hour ago, she replied. My car is in the garage across the street. I think I can make it there. See you at 7. Except for the unexpected conversation with Jill, everything went as planned. The next few days would be thrilling. Angela was sitting in the living room when I returned home. Thanks for taking my clothes to the hospital. I'd appreciate a ride back, I said. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure how long you'd be gone and wanted to be here when the girls got back from school, she replied. I went upstairs to take a shower. Oh, by the way, I'm okay. No need to worry. Later, when I came downstairs, Angela was still in the same position. She looked at me but said nothing. The smug smile had disappeared. It was only four in the afternoon. Dinner was still three hours away. I decided to go for a drive. As I backed out of the driveway, the girls were just coming home from school. Dinner was an absolute delight. Though everything went quietly and smoothly, I had a great time. Jill and I were like cat and mouse. I didn't confess anything, and she didn't tell me about her suspicions. She was raised by her mother, and there had never been a man or father figure in her life. I got the sense that she didn't trust men at all and didn't interact with them. It took us an hour to finish our salad before we ordered our food. We spent the entire evening repeating the same things. She told me how smart I was, and I told her how insightful she was. We stayed there for over two hours, talking constantly and essentially saying nothing. It was wonderful. We promised to meet again on Monday evening. When I returned home, I found that Angela was sleeping with the girls again. I provided for her and gave her everything. She discarded it all and now seemed lost. Frank was married and he had his own family. He would drop her in a second and she knew it. 
she also knew that I would never take her back. Angela found herself at the center of it all, and it made her miserable. I once loved her, but now there was neither love nor pity. I genuinely believed that she was afraid of me. Perhaps Frank would protect her. I left home early Sunday morning and was gone all day. I found various ways to pass the time without spending much money. When I returned home around 6, I found the house empty. Angela left me a note. She took the girls and went to visit her parents in Tennessee. There was no mention of when she might return. Most of their clothes were gone. It seemed she planned to stay for a while. I think I felt relieved. First thing in the morning, I went to Seymour's office. Seymour was a bit secretive, but as a lawyer, I liked him. He had already received the DNA test results from the lab overnight. I think it was Jill's idea. There was no doubt. My betrayer was Frank Perella. I explained to Seymour why I sent him a copy of the test results. He said that under the circumstances, it was a great idea. I gave him a copy of the recording where Officer Perella threatened me. I told him about the affair Perella had with my wife, providing times and dates. At 10, Seymour and I were in the district attorney's office. Two imposing men entered the room with folders and tablets. After introducing themselves, they began to explain that they couldn't continue the investigation because there was no DNA evidence. Seymour started laughing, and I struggled to keep a straight face. Gentlemen, under the circumstances, we anticipated that the DNA test results might be inaccurate, so we sent several duplicates. I know it's a bit unusual but it seems it was worth the effort. Don't you think? I believe it's important to ensure that justice is served, isn't it? Seymour slid two copies of the DNA test results across the table to the men representing me. The original was filed in the courthouse at 9 a.m. These are just working copies. I was afraid the original might get lost again. Seymour was good. That's why I hired him. The district attorney and his assistant sighed simultaneously and seemed to slump in their chairs. You knew it was Frank Perella even before we walked into this room, didn't you? Neither of them answered the question. After a few seconds, the district attorney began to speak. Why would Frank Perella, an outstanding and decorated officer, do this? I'm sorry, but it's inconceivable. Seymour grinned from ear to ear. Officer Perella had an affair with Mr. Briscoe's wife, Angela. It lasted for several months. His partner can confirm this. When Mr. Briscoe confronted his wife and asked her to stop, she immediately told Frank Perella, then Officer Perella and his partner pulled Mr. Briscoe over and their partner pulled Mr. Briscoe over in their patrol car and Officer Perella threatened to send Mr. Briscoe to jail if he didn't drop the matter. The district attorney leaned back in his chair and smiled. That's the biggest fairy tale I've ever heard. You won't convince me or the jury that any of this ever happened. Finally. I'd had enough. I raised my hand to Seymour, indicating I wanted to speak. Leaning over the table, I looked the district attorney straight in the eye. It's supposed to be you and me against the world. This is the second time in ten minutes you've concluded that I'm a liar. If you do it again, I'll sue you and the entire city for defamation with a ton of media coverage. Sit here, shut up, and listen. When the recording finishes, I expect apologies from both of you.
I pressed play on my dictaphone. Seymour leaned back in his chair, still grinning. Who do you think you are? My relationship with your wife is none of your business, and I'd advise you to stay out of it and keep your mouth shut. If you make any more smart remarks about Angela, I'll make sure you get a nice stint in Greaterford. I'm sure some of the boys there would love to have. You as a neighbor. Am I clear? I leaned back in my chair and let Seymour take the lead. Will you recognize Frank Perella's voice? Or do we need an expert to confirm it for you? Maybe internal affairs would be interested in this case. I received immediate apologies from both gentlemen. Seymour and I apologized in return and stood up to leave. Call me when you've gathered your thoughts, and we'll talk again, Seymour said. And by the end of the day, I'd like to get a restraining order. So all uniformed officers stay away from Mr. Briscoe. It seems retaliation is in the air. The two men in suits just sat there, watching us leave. Jill and I had a great time at the restaurant that evening. She wanted me to come up for a nightcap, but I chickened out. Maybe next time, I told her. Somehow, the whole story got leaked to the local newspaper. They didn't withhold any names, including Angela's. It didn't matter much since she wasn't there, and I doubted she'd ever return. However, it did matter to Frank Perella's wife and her two brothers. In law, Frank got roughed up and he didn't say who did it. I always wondered if it was because of the affair or what he did to the guy. Either way, the results were the same. Frank's situation wasn't looking great. In the end, he had to plead guilty. He got five years, but avoided the publicity of a trial. Among regular folks, Frank would have big problems. Which brings me to my old friend Charlie. Some guy had been hitting on Charlie's wife a while back, and he ended up in the hospital. Charlie did his time in prison because they had a bricklaying program there. He spent two years in a maximum security prison teaching a group how to lay bricks. I visited Charlie's wife, Josie. Their daughter, Sarah, graduated high school and got accepted to a dental hygiene school in Boyertown. The only issue was she needed six grand for tuition. Since Charlie was in prison, the family had to rely on Josie's income. I knew all this beforehand, so I came prepared. I gave Josie a check for Sarah's tuition and a sealed envelope. I asked her to give the envelope to Charlie when she visited him next. Seymour prepared and mailed the divorce papers to Angela at her parents' house in Bristol. I granted her custody of the kids and child support, but no alimony. Her infidelity was well documented, and Seymour took care of that. Jill and I discussed the possibility of me seeking custody, but we both agreed I was too unstable to be an effective father. I got along quite well with both my daughters, and sometimes felt closer to them than their mother. Jill and I were kindred spirits. Wow, that's deep. She was the only girl I ever felt comfortable with. I didn't reveal all my secrets to her, and she didn't share hers with me, but somehow we grew close. Since Angela was gone, and soon she would be permanently out of my life, I felt no guilt about sleeping with Jill. She moved into the house with me. She wasn't a great cook, but she wasn't a great cook, but she was good at almost everything else. We often dined out. Jill had this mysterious aura about her. I learned about it later. 
Angela signed and returned the papers almost immediately. She didn't ask for anything and didn't even hire a lawyer. Three months from now, I'll be free. I didn't need to stay here until the end. Jill and I spent a lot of time discussing relocation options. We decided it would be nice to be without snow, but we still wanted four seasons. Getting a transfer in my company wouldn't be a problem. Jill could find a job almost anywhere. Huntsville, Alabama seemed like the perfect place to us. It was close to Nashville and Chattanooga. And the taxes were low. A good house could be bought for half the price of most other places. Before leaving, I heard that Frank Perella hadn't been treated well by his cellmates. The guards suspected it was some kind of revenge. Up to this point, everything went as planned. We didn't expect a phone call from Angela's parents. Tid, this is Mary, Angela's mother. Sorry to bother you, but we need help. What kind of help? What's going on? Angela isn't taking care of the girls. She's not even coming close to them. She claims they're mad at her because of what she did to you. That sounds off. She refused to tell us what exactly she did to you that upset them. In fact, she's practically refusing to talk about anything. We really need your help. Is she okay otherwise? No. She's holed up in her room all day with the door locked. I have to bring her food. She seems to be afraid of her own daughters. What do you want me to do? You need to come and get the girls. We can take care of Angela, but not the girls too. All right. We'll be passing through Bristol on Saturday. We'll stop by and pick them up. Have everything ready. Thank you, Ted. We appreciate it. I explained to Jill that I wasn't cut out to be a parent. With my quirky character traits, the girls would grow up just as quirky as me. Outwardly, I may seem normal, but inside, I'm far from it. After a few hours, she decided that we should give it a try. Jill would be the stay. At home, mom. For some reason, I felt like she was expecting this. We rented a small house west of Huntsville for a year. Bristol was conveniently on the way. Jill was nervous about meeting the girls. I was nervous about the upcoming encounter with Angela. However, things didn't go as expected. I couldn't bring myself to tell Jill that my daughters were a bit unusual. Angela's parents greeted us with a sigh of relief. We entered the house, and when Angela saw me, she immediately ran to her room and locked the door. I guess I wasn't worried about anything. I decided to leave things as they were. Jill was standing in the living room when my two daughters approached. For a few seconds, they looked at each other, and then broad smiles appeared on all three faces. It felt like they shared a joke, and I was left out. However, I was very pleased with the first meeting. The girls approached Jill, and each of them hugged her, something they never did with their mother. Jill placed her hands on each of their heads and smiled. Jill, I'd like to introduce you to my daughters, Lilith and Sybil, I said, feeling like the introduction was unnecessary. I think the next few years of my life are going to be very interesting.